Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here. Happy, healthy. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We're in the book of Luke again, picking up where we left off. We're going to be in chapter 6, verses 12 and following. I uh, hope you guys are enjoying. I'm, I just love the Gospels because they're so rich, and there's such meaning and such depth and such application to the way that we live. It's not like a long narrative of historical fact. It's actually something you can put your teeth into and put a handle on and carry out of here and practice. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Before we get started, just pray with me, if you would. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you that we can be here, that we can meet, that we can study your word and proclaim your name. We can do it openly. Thank you for the worship where we're able to center our attention on you and the finished work that your son has done at the cross for us. I pray that we would appropriate it to ourselves this morning, your grace, your forgiveness, and the freedom that we have from sin. I pray that you help us now, Lord, as we look to your word, that we would pay attention, that you might speak to our hearts, that you might illuminate our minds, that you might inspire our feet to walk in the footsteps you have for us. So, Lord, use this day. Fill us here with your presence and with your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 6. I've, I've selected verse 13. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. From them, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. We know eventually they get called apostles, which means sent out ones. They're his disciples, but he chooses 12. He calls all of the disciples, which there were many people following Jesus at that point, but he calls the 12, and he chooses them, each of them by name, including Judas, which I find very curious. Just to remind you men, yes, we're having a retreat. We're going to be having it here. Uh, 35 bucks a head is going to cover food and teaching. Please sign up if you're serious uh, so we can get a count and we can get going. Uh, I think you're going to find it very enlightening. If you don't know what it is to be a biblical man, and if you watch enough news and TV shows, you'll have no clue especially if you watch The Simpsons and Married with Children. I can think of a whole bunch of dramas which just do not have a biblical male figure in our society, has no idea what it is. In fact, they're trying to obliterate any differences between male and female. Yeah. Uh, you know, switch, swap, because it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. And Scripture's very, very clear about it. I've been studying, actually, to a point of distraction, uh, which is why I haven't gotten a lot of sleep today, so I'm a little off my game. But it's just, it, the more you look, the more that you find in, in the Word, and it's uh, good. So I, it's going to be a great time. Hopefully, you, men, you can show up. So we're picking it up here in Luke chapter 6, just to remind you where you were. We've been going through Luke chapter 5. Jesus has an encounter with four people. One is Peter, and there's this miraculous catch of fish. There's a leper that comes up, and he was filled with leprosy, Luke tells us. He's a doctor, he knows. And it was, he was healed from head to toe. We see that Jesus also had a Bible study in Peter's house. And they couldn't get this poor friend of theirs. So they dug this roof open and lowered him right in front of Jesus in the middle of him having an important Bible study. And he says, your sins are forgiven, which ruffled a few feathers. And he says, I said it so that you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on the earth. And aren't you glad for that? So then he meets Matthew. He's called Levi before his name change. And he calls him, and he calls him away from his very lucrative business. And they end up having a party at his house. And there were all these tax collectors and sinners that were there. And the, all of the heavy-duty rabbis were kept outside, and they weren't invited, and they wouldn't go in anyway. And they were all judgmental about, why does Jesus, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners. It's funny they didn't go to Jesus. They went to his disciples complained. It's like that. <laughs> yeah. And so he tells them, it's, it's not the well that need a doctor, it's the sick. Yeah. And apparently you guys aren't sick, are you? 
that we saw they were going through the grain fields and pulling grain and they were eating little handfuls of granola and of course they got judgmental on them and Jesus taught them some things about the Sabbath. There was also a lame, a man who was withered in his right hand, Luke tells us, and he stretches it out and Jesus heals him right there, right in the middle of the temple, right on the Sabbath, which ruffled their feathers again. It's almost like Jesus picked the Sabbath just to prove a point just like he says, your sins are forgiven. And he does that just to prove a point because it's not just these rabbis that are there, but his disciples are there. Everything Jesus does is about teaching. Even all of his healings. He does all these healings. He, he heals a blind man and he says, I'm the light of the world. He, he breaks off and feeds 5,000 men, uh, which means there are many more than that. And he says, I am the bread of life. So, Everything that Jesus does is teaching constantly. Now we're in chapter six where he chooses the 12 specifically. He's called them, but now he's going to pick them for full-time ministry as he goes into ministry in chapter six. Beginning in verse 12, it says, now it came to pass in those days when he went out to the mountain to pray and he continued all night in prayer to God. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases and as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them all. So we pick it up from verse 12. He goes out from a mountain and he prays all night. I don't know if you've ever done this. It, it, you know, if you have to work in the morning and drive heavy machinery, it might not be advisable, but Jesus prays all night. And now you know why. Because he's got to pick 12. And this is, this is a bit more than picking a kickball team. This is picking the disciples when it was day, he called the disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12. He had an important decision to make, and he ended up praying all night. Have you ever had an important decision to make and pray all night? I don't know about you, but I, I tend not to be that dependent upon God to make decisions. I tend to just kind of, you know, ready, shoot, aim at times, a little like Peter. But Jesus, and he even being the son of God, stayed up all night with his father because he was going to pick 12. It doesn't seem like a big deal for the son of God. But if he prays all night before making a big decision like that, what right do I have to make decisions quickly? Nothing. And very often we think we know enough, we're smart enough, we're strong enough, we can handle this. And we don't really ask the Lord what he would have us do. And I think that we would avoid a lot of trouble if we would ask the Lord before we made decisions. So making tough decisions about people in your life, <laughs> it's a good idea to seek the Lord's wisdom because people are probably some of the most difficult things to handle. You know, things, you know, like your car breaks down, that's pretty simple. You know, maybe you need a new one, maybe you need to fix yours, whatever. But that's pretty simple. But when you have personality rubs with people, when you have personal relationship issues with people, when you have a history with people, when there's been wrongs on both sides toward one another and there's a history of shooting arrows at each other, it's a good idea to seek the Lord because without that, we end up acting in the flesh and we make things much worse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he 
will direct your paths. You see, the promise comes with a condition. We have to seek him first before he guides us and before he leads us. It's not after. You know, you make a bad decision. You go, oh, Lord, what should I do now? He's like, I, I wish you would ask me earlier. <laughs> At least that's, that's the, the way I think of it. But just like you, they were chosen. And just like you, they were flawed, the 12 disciples. And it's interesting. I'm, I can imagine Jesus praying and saying, you know, which ones? And, and you know, God tells him, no wonder he stayed up all night. Maybe he was waking for, for a second opinion. <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, do you, Peter, he, he opens his mouth just to insert his other foot. You know, it's, you got James and John, the, 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 these sons of thunder who want to, you know, call down fire from heaven on a town because they didn't want Jesus to go into the town. And he goes, you don't know what spirit you're of. I just, I, I love seeing all of that because it reminds me of me. Amen. And I know there's hope for me. <laughs> so here are the disciples. Simon, who was also called Peter. Simon means unstable, by the way. It means, could go either way. And that's kind of the way it was with Peter. And Jesus called him Peter and gave him a new name. It's interesting. Did Jesus give you a new name? Did he give you a new identity? Yes. I've always thought of calling myself Dave. <laughs> it's spelled exactly the same. It just has one little <laughs> on the E. So. But Jesus named him Peter, which means rock. So he's rocky. He, he goes from eh to rocky. I love that. And that's who he becomes. And it's interesting. He doesn't become that until the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Amen. And it's like that with us. You can either be a rock or you could kind of, you know, go either way. You could be variable. Andrew, his brother. A Andrew was always his brother. You know, there's Simon and, oh yeah, there's Andrew. He was always kind of second. If, you, if you're second in line, you know, uh, and you have an older brother or an older uh, sibling, you tend to kind of get swept into the same category with the older and, you know, oh, you're so-and-so's, you know. It's one of those things. You're kind of living in their shadow all the time. Andrew was that way. But Andrew was always good at bringing people to Jesus. Amen. He would bring people to Jesus. The Greeks wanted to talk to somebody. They couldn't go right to Jesus, and they couldn't get to Peter, who's the mouth. But they got to Andrew, because Andrew was there. And so Andrew would listen, and Andrew brought people. And so that, that's how Andrew's known. And you have James and John, who are the sons of thunder, uh, the Zebedees and uh, their family was actually involved with Jesus and the ministry, which is great to have a support. Uh, James, uh, they call him James the Great or the Greater. It might have been because he was larger. It might have been because he was wider. Uh, it might have been because he was louder. Uh, don't know why he was called the Greater. And then there's James the Lesser. There's two of them. Uh, I, I don't know if I was James the Lesser, if I'd like that name, but I guess they dealt with it. James, it could be younger, and then that's a compliment. That's true. James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, and, and we, see, um, we see a couple of events with them, but not too much. Then there's Matthew, which we just saw the calling of, and Thomas, who's known for doubting Thomas. By the way, he wasn't doubting. He was unbelieving Thomas. He wasn't just doubting. He says, I will not believe unless I stick my fingers into the hands, in the holes in his hands, and I thrust my arm into the hole in his side. That's pretty dramatic unbelief. That's not just doubting. So I think he got a rotten name. I think he's unbelieving, Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, not to be confused with the other James. Simon, called the zealot, not to be confused with Simon Peter, which may be why Jesus named him Peter, so they wouldn't confuse the two Simons. But he was a zealot, and these guys were known for training to be assassins. They hated the Romans, and they would kill them. They would come up behind them in the marketplace, and there, there's uh, historical records of this, go behind them and stab them. Just stab them right, right from the back, and they knew exactly where to go to, to make a, a fatal wound. So these zealots 
weren't just zealous for God, they were zealous to kill Romans. So here's, here's an assassin on the team, which could have its benefits if you didn't have any morals, but Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James, by the way, he takes another name. You might know it as Thaddeus if you look in the other gospels. And they do that probably not to confuse Judas with Judas. And Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. It's interesting. Jesus knew exactly where his heart was and what he was all about, and he chose him anyway, just like me. And he knows that I'm not the most faithful person, and he chose me just like he chose you. And so what a ragtag bunch. I don't know if you've been watching The Chosen, but it's uh, absolutely fantastic. And you, if you haven't, you should check it out. It's really quite encouraging. It says here in Psalm 37, verses 3 to 7, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall, he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way because of man who brings wicked schemes to pass. As I was thinking through Jesus choosing these disciples, there's a whole lot to be concerned about with these crowd, you know, including Judas Iscariot. And this passage says, don't worry about what people think they're getting away with because they're getting away with nothing. If you happen to watch TV at all or read anything on the internet, the world's gone to hell in a handbasket. Yes. This psalm might be for you, Psalm 37. Don't fret about evil men getting away with things. You got Cuomo being put up on charges. You got all this stuff going on. Guess what? God is still on the throne. Amen. And he knows what's going on. And he knew what was going on in choosing these 12. And he knew what was going on when he chose you. Amen. And it says, he who began a good work will continue it to the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. If he began a good work in you, if he has begun to stir your heart and draw you to himself and illuminate your mind and soften your heart, know that he will finish the process. And so here's the rap sheet. Here's all the boys. They all died unnatural deaths for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is now taking all of them and preparing them for what they're about to get into. And I don't, I don't know if you know this, but they can actually attest to where the remains of all of these guys are. Um, most of them in Italy. Uh, John, who died a natural death, is buried in Ephesus, which is a church that he was a pastor of in Turkey. And you can, you can go there and, and see all these places. Uh, if, if I was uh, incredibly wealthy and I had no responsibilities, I would travel and go see all these guys. By the way, this is uh, the apostles in somebody's mind. Apparently, they were uh, in a choir. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know why they're that way. And he came down, meaning Jesus, with them. And he stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples. So that's more than just the 12. And a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast, Tyre and Sidon. By the way, that's, that's a big area. So there are lots of people who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. You know, those are two really good reasons to come to Jesus. They came to hear him, to learn, to be taught, to be discipled. And they came to be healed of their diseases. You know, the word of God has this wonderful power in our lives to rinse us through and give us conviction so that our lives change. And hopefully you guys are here for the same reason, to hear the word. Who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. That's another good reason to come to Jesus. Amen. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the world for a really long time and learned a whole lot of bad things. Yeah. It's taken a long time to unlearn those bad things. Yeah. And they don't disappear easily. 
And it's not without dying to yourself and having to ask God to cleanse you of those evil spirits. And they were healed. Short sentence. And the whole multitude sought to touch him. I mean, you know, like the Beatles, like if you've ever seen the Beatles, <sighs> crowds running after them, grabbing them. I can't imagine. I'm glad I'm unknown. <laughs> the whole multitude sought to touch him and power went out from him and healed them all. That's not said lightly. He healed them all. This gigantic multitude of people that came because there's no one that comes to Jesus that doesn't get healed. Amen. 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 Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. for My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary souls, Jesus says. And they did. Amen. So they crowded around him. They were all healed, but they were the ones who sought him. Can you imagine having the choice? Say, hey, you're going to go see the healer? Nah. There are a lot of people doing that today. They won't come to Jesus, and so they walk around with their maladies. Well, class is now in session. Jesus started teaching his 12 disciples. He chose them, and then he went right into this crowd, and he's just boom, 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 healing all these people. And, and the disciples are all part of that. Notice he doesn't have them doing anything. You know, you figure you got, a, you got a team of 12 guys. Why not spread the work out, right? Delegation. That's good management skills. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He takes point because there's a point in which he will leave and it will be on them. But you see, our obligation is first to learn from him and then we can be like him. But we have to learn from him first. Second section. And then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples by the way, it's important to know who he's speaking to here. And he said, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast, <laughs> cast out your name as evil. For the son of man's sake, rejoice in that day and leap. Yes, the scripture says, any of you leap recently? <laughs> leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner, their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Any of you feeling a little convicted? How many of you are rich, I wonder? Every one of you should have your hand up. Did you eat today? I didn't get a chance, but I'll get there. You know I will. <laughs> you're blessed if you're poor, if you're hungry, if you weep, and if people hate you. And your response should be leaping. <laughs> Vertical action. This is not a health and wealth prosperity message. Jesus is not tickling the ears of people. And he says, if you're poor, hungry, weep, or people hate you for the son of man's sake, not because you're, you're stupid, you know, you, you, uh, you, know, you mock people, you're, you do illegal things, you're, you're not thoughtful, you're disrespectful, you're unforgiving, you're bitter, you're angry, none of those things. But for the son of man, if you have these qualities, you're poor, you're hungry, you weep, and, you, and you're hated, for the son of man's sake, which means somebody's got to know you're a Christian Amen. through your words, your behavior, your activity. And they have to hate you for it. And that's when you're supposed to leap. They'll think you're nuts. <laughs> it's like, hey, 
Did you know you could be forgiven of your sins so you can stand before God completely innocent? Jesus freak. All right. I don't want to hurt my back because that's exactly what I'll do. Woe to you if you're rich. We're all rich. As far as financial prosperity is concerned, every single person in this room and anybody that's got a computer that can hear this message is rich. If you can afford a phone, you're rich. That's a luxury. No, it's a necessity. No, it's not. You got a TV? I bet you got more than one. It's not a necessity. You got a car? It's not a necessity. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Any of you got a little bump? Right in here? <laughs> Woe to you who laugh now. Suddenly no laughing in the congregation today. <laughs> and when all men speak well of you, I mean, isn't that a desirable end to get people to like you? I mean, Zig Ziglar thinks so. I need to have people, you know, I need to be able to influence people and make friends easily. And I mean, isn't that what being a Christian is? Maybe I've been listening to the TV too much. I struggled with these passages. I struggled with them. I'll tell you what I found. Verse 20, and then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples. By the way, that's who he's speaking to. You don't preach this to the world. You know you should be poor. You should have everyone hate you. You tell the world that and they're not going to get it. Hopefully, by the end of this, you'll understand it a little more clearer. He lifted his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. I love Matthew because he gives it a, a little well-roundedness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, I feel better. It's not necessarily physical finances he's referring to. Poor in spirit. You know what poor in spirit means? I looked it up for you. It means you are reduced to beggary, begging, asking alms of wealth, influence, position, honor, lowly, afflicted, destitute of the Christian virtues of eternal riches, helpless, powerless to accomplish an end, poor, needy, lacking in anything. As respects to the spirit, destitute of wealth, of learning, and intellectual culture, which the schools afford. In other words, if you think you know something, you don't know nothing. To be destitute of spirit means I am dependent upon the power of God to live a righteous life. And without which I would be a murdering, adultering world killer. That's what it is to be poor in spirit, which is I can contribute nothing to what God does in my heart. Amen? Amen. I am dependent upon the grace of God and his Holy Spirit to move me and help me to do the right things because without that, I am helpless. That's what it is to be poor in spirit. Blessed are you if you're poor in spirit. Not the happy and confident yep. to go out there and, you know, like it's a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Jesus says you're blessed when you're poor, not when you're rich. In Mark 10, 21, and Jesus looking at him, this is the rich young ruler, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. Jesus said this to the rich young ruler who came to him and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And he goes, well, you know, you know the commandments, and he raffles off a few. And he goes, oh, I've done all of those since I was a boy. <laughs> you never coveted something that you don't own? Really? You never looked at a woman lustfully? You never were angry with anybody? Hmm. That's a lie. And Jesus doesn't call him on the lie. And he says, well, there's one thing you lack. Get rid of all your stuff. 
By the way, this isn't a call to being a communist. It doesn't mean that you give away all your stuff and the government owns everything and decides who gets what. That's not it. It's, we don't have everything in, in even uh, amounts, and you shouldn't, because work is what produces wealth. Why should people who don't work get anything? At least if you're able-bodied. So he says to him, one thing you lack, go sell all that you have. By the way, if you give away everything you have, you know you got nothing left to give, right? So how are you going to bless anybody else ever again? It's kind of a once and done thing. It wasn't for all of us. He's telling this guy because it's the one thing that he can't do. He's greedy and a liar on top of that. Money is one of those things that will corrupt your heart because you have no needs. I don't need to pray. I don't need to ask God for anything because I have everything I need physically. Therefore, I am blind to think that I need anything spiritually. And that tends to be the tendency, isn't it? Life is good. I've got my health. I got a new car. I got a job. I got the, you know, I got the wife. I got the kids. I, I'm good. Really? Well, aren't you poor in spirit? Don't you need Jesus for anything? Don't you feel the weight of the sin that's inside of your body? Don't you long to be free of your body and be with the Lord? Yes. That's what it is to be poor in spirit, which is I can't wait to get the heck out of here and the Lord come back and take me home because I struggle with desire inside my own self, with desiring things that once you get them, they don't mean anything. I got a new phone some weeks back. Works just like the old phone. I just have to pay more. And it's deeply dissatisfying. Oh, I got this new phone. <laughs> Good feeling gone. And it's like that, because it never, ever will fill that spot that only God can fill. Blessed are you if you're poor. Are you poor now? Yours is the kingdom of God. Because God grants the kingdom to those who are dependent upon him, not upon their own strength. Blessed are you who hunger now. Oh, I don't like this one. For you shall be filled. And blessed are you who weep now. I don't like that one either. For you shall laugh. So Jesus says you're blessed if you're hungry now. Do you know what a blessing necessity is? I know you make, you make that face. What? What? You know how, you know why hunger's good? Because you can go and satisfy that hunger. And you will appreciate a good meal after you've been hungry. I, when I go outside and I do work and I get all sweated up and I'm just drenched, water is the most valuable thing on the planet. And you drink a glass of water, you're like, there is nothing like a glass of water. You know, you couldn't put a shot of anything or a glass of beer or anything else. Water. Amen. Water satisfies the very thing that your body needs. Need is something that we have to have in our life. You know what happens when people get everything they want? We call that being spoiled. And then the slightest imperfection. Wait, it's one degree too cool in here. Oh, don't tell me you don't get that way. I can't believe somebody sat in my chair at church today. <laughs> I had to sit one whole row back. I mean, <laughs> totally different dynamic and everything. <laughs> this, is, this is the way we are. We get used to getting our own way and we get spoiled. Shouldn't have that expectation. But being hungry is a good thing because then you appreciate a good meal. I, I don't know about you, but I, I go away in pastor's conferences and they serve you three meals a day and the lines to get in line. And it's great food and say, oh, look at this, look at this. <laughs> and you load up and you eat and you're talking and you're having fellowship and it's great. And you sit down and you listen to some teaching and then it's like, oh, lunch? I haven't quite digested breakfast. But I'm getting in line, I'm filling up the plate. <laughs> then, oh, I got lunch, uh, maybe some salad, you know. And, it, and you're like, Woo, need a nap. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go learn now. Oh, okay. You, you drag your fat, sloppy self to go learn. 
And then it's like, wow, it's great. The really Lord, the Lord really spoke to me. And it's like, dinner? We got to go to dinner? And there's like dessert and stuff? <sighs> All right. And you get in line. And it's like misery. It's like work. I don't know. Or if you ever go to a, like an all-you-can-eat place, it's like, they ain't making no money on me, man. I, that's the way we are. And Jesus says, you're blessed if you're hungry. And of course, the physical is a shadow of the spiritual. What should you be hungry for? More of him. More of his presence in our life. More of his direction in our life. Hungry for more relationship with God. Hungry to put into effect all the things that you know, because you know we know far more than what we do. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty for the word of God? Are you, is it something that your heart yearns for? And then do you throw it in, you know, you take the car out of neutral and throw it and drive and actually do something about that. That's what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are you if you're hungry. And he's talking on a spiritual level, but the physical is a shadow of that. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Jesus says that he puts necessity in our life to drive us to him. You got a necessity? You got something you need? Do you have something you're confused about and you're not solid on? Do you know the Lord puts that in your life to drive you to him? You got some inabilities? I do. I, 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 I have a whole bunch of them. They're called vertebrae. I got all kinds of inabilities. I broke both my elbows. I can't straighten them out. I got all kinds of inabilities. I'm old. Sometimes getting in my clothes is an inability. And Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Could it be any clearer? You got a shortcoming? You got a need? Jesus says, come to me. I'll straighten it out for you. But you got to come. Ask, seek, and knock, and it will be open. In John 6, 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus uses these idioms all the time, and he's not merely speaking of physical. This is a metaphor of the spiritual. Come to him, and you won't always be trying to stuff things into your life that never really satisfy you. It's like cotton candy. Who in the world wants to eat cotton candy for a meal? No. It, it just disappears. It melts. It's tasty and delicious, but it doesn't fill you. In fact, it sickens you. Yes. <laughs> Jesus says, come to me. And, you know, a lot of this world is just cotton candy, guys. In Romans 12, 15 to 16... We're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I don't know about you, but crying is just not something I can push a button and do. How about you? Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. That's called pride or arrogance or ego. Jesus said we should be rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. The problem is we try to insulate and isolate ourselves from all difficulty, all hardship, all heartache. Go visit a hospital. One of the greatest cures of depression is find somebody that's got it worse than you. But we don't do that. We insulate, we isolate. We, I've got all that I need right here. I don't need to go anywhere. Go to a hospital. Go see somebody who is really in need. And suddenly your, your, your little need is nothing. And your heart will grow three sizes. Ecclesiastes 7, 2 to 4. It's always, it's always a danger when you bring up Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. This is the Bible, by the way. I'm just letting you know it's not my opinion this is scriptural. 
for that is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. Oh, you can't mean that. No, he means it. For by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. You know, there are a lot of people at parties and nothing good is happening. <laughs> Clink, drink. There's no good thing happening. You go to a funeral, you know what? There's some good things happening there. There are relationships that are mending. There's friends that you won't see otherwise unless there's a funeral. There are things that are happening there and everyone is going to be faced with the fact that their life is going to end, which is what some people don't talk about. There was once a rich man who forbid anyone to talk about death in his presence. I thought that was funny. It wasn't J. Paul Getty. I forget. But anyway, he forbid anyone to talk about death, but of course, didn't help. He died. That's when you begin to take stock of your life and you start to do a self-assessment and you go before the Lord and you say, hey, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing what I should be doing? You go out at night and you have fun and you party. And there's, there's nothing of eternal value in that. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Something to think about. Because our culture here in America, we don't think that way. We think, oh, they're having a party and they didn't invite me. My self-esteem is ruined. So what? Find a funeral. <laughs> Go to a hospital. That's where real things happen. That's where you'll actually have a change of life. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you. <laughs> they didn't invite me. They defriended me. And revile you, revile you, revile you, and cast out your name as evil. I never want to hear that name mentioned in my house again. For the son of man's sake, not because you're a bonehead, but because you stand for Jesus Christ. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I want to see you guys leap sometime. <laughs> for indeed, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner, your fathers did to the prophets. Those people of old who came and spoke the truth and told it like it was, ended up dying for that or being excluded or being pushed out. You know, this world is so afraid of truth anymore. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, well, haven't you heard? There's no such thing as truth. There's your truth. There's my truth. Well, what if my truth says... I'm, you see, I'm ev evolutionist, and I believe that only the strong survive. And because I can wrestle you to the ground, take your life and everything you own, I think I should do that. That's my truth. How's that going over? Well, that's the basic case of evolution. You're a weaker of the species, and you deserve to be snuffed out, and I take all your stuff. It's the king of the mountain. That's what, you, that's what we did when we were kids, right? Try to get the big guy off the mountain, and then you take the mountain, and everybody tries to kill you. It doesn't work. Acts 7, 51 to 53, this is Stephen when he is speaking to all of these guys. He's a deacon, okay? He, he's a table waiter. He makes sure that people get food at the right time, and he's running around. He's a busy guy, but he's deeply spiritual. And they, they get him cornered, and he begins to preach his lungs out, and this guy could preach. And he talks about the whole history of Israel and talks about everything that happened. And of course, all these people are Jews and he's, it seems like he's softening them up. And they seem to be like, yeah, amen, brother. That's right. We, we were descended from Abraham. And yeah, and all that's going on. And then he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did and so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. He had them right there until he said these things. Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. 
He tells them this long story and he pulls them in and he says, you're a bunch of murderers. You took the Messiah and put him on a cross and killed him. And the word of God was delivered to you by angels and you don't even keep it. There's a man who spoke the truth and then they picked up stones to stone him. They tore their clothes in a sign of internal anguish and then they stoned him to death. And Jesus Christ makes a personal appearance to him just before he goes. Jesus said, you're blessed if people revile you because of me, if they persecute you because of me, if they hate you and they don't want your name to be spoken of, it's spoken of as evil for me. You should wear that proudly. But you know, as Christians, we tend to be kind of ashamed that we're believers in Jesus. It's like, well, you one of them Christians? Well, what do you mean by that? We find little elusive ways to be able to get around it. Well, I'm a believer. I'm sorry. <laughs> but woe to you who are rich. These are the four woes. He said the four blessings. He's going to say the four woes, which are just the opposite. But woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. You know, Jesus talked about the Pharisees, how they were blind guides. And they got upset with Jesus. And they said, are you calling us blind? And he goes, well, since you mention it, since you're so insistent that you don't think you're blind, now you're in deep trouble. This is the Jersey version. You're in deep trouble because you know better. And so, yeah, you're blind. Because you fight the fact that I tell you you're blind. If somebody said, hey, listen, there's something you don't understand, and you go, huh, really? I don't think you understand. You're just, showing, you're just showing who you really are then. Woe to you who are rich. I've got enough. I don't need to hear what you got to say. I don't, I, you know, I got my thing, you know. I, oh, so you've got enough. You don't, you don't have a tremendous deficit spiritually? Of course you do. You just think you're rich. Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. He says, it's so hard for a rich man to come into the kingdom of heaven. It's like taking a camel and putting it through the eye of a needle. And that's exactly what Jesus meant. It's called hyperbole. Everybody say hyperbole. hyperbole. It's exaggeration. We do this all the time. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Well, you may have eaten horse at one point and not known it, but I don't think you could eat an entire horse, which is what you're saying, right? That's hyperbole. We understand that. It's figure of speech. So, with men, this is impossible. For anybody to enter the kingdom of heaven, it's impossible because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us makes the mark. Jesus did, and he offers it as a gift to us. And that's the only way anyone's going to make it to heaven. Socrates said it well. He said, one thing only I know, and that is, I know nothing. That's pretty good. That's pretty wise. I'll accept that. It, ding, that goes, that goes along with truth. I'm good. Jesus says, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. You know, there are people that think they have everything and they get to the place where they realize they're empty. I, I, I listened to Ravi Zacharias and he was talking about how he spoke to a man in Taiwan who had everything. He was the head of a, a huge corporation. He was on the, on the top of this gigantic building. Then he went to meet him because he was requested to go. And he began to speak with him. And this guy was talking about suicide, how he wanted to kill himself because nothing in life was satisfying. He was a billionaire. He could have anything he wanted. He could jump in a flight and go anywhere in the world. He could do anything. He could have anything to eat. He could go anywhere in the world. He could hire fire. He could do anything he wanted. And he had no fulfillment in his life. He was able to share the gospel with him. When you think you're full, you're not. Because this world doesn't have the right stuff to fill 
that God-shaped hole inside of each one of us. He says, you who are full, who say, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm good, I'm good. You're not really full. You will be hungry. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. And we sing this song here. Come to the altar. Because nothing in this world will satisfy like having a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness that he will give. So when is an unsatisfied craving better than satisfaction? I don't know about you, but when I'm thirsty, I want to drink, when I want to eat, you know, when I'm hungry, I, I, I eat, you know, when I have to go to the bathroom, I leave immediately, you know, like I have, I have desires and, and I look to fulfill them. And, and on the other side of that, I'm like, ah. Oh. So when is an unsatisfied desire a better thing? Well, all day long, all day long, it's called self-control. If, if I say, boy, I'm really hungry, so what's for lunch? I don't care. What's the closest place? A pizzeria. No problem. Order me one. One what? A pizza. <laughs> it's better for me to have a slice and be done. Now, will I be thoroughly satisfied of my deep, deep hunger? But I also won't have to take a nap immediately. All day long. Do I get to say everything I want to say? You might think I do. There's a lot of editorializing that happens here. And I got to keep a careful watch because I could, you know, pop out with things at any moment. Do I get to go everywhere I want? Do I get to do everything I want? Do I get to jump on the bed at home? The ceiling's only this high. I, can't, I could never do that. <laughs> All day long, it is better to have a craving that is unsatisfied than to have a satisfied craving. Very often. My son and my daughter both dated people. I had to tell them to wait until they got married to fulfill a desire. Well, when is it good to not have a fulfilled desire? All day. Pick something. You know what I want to do when I'm done? Hey, I'm done. See you later, guys. Lock the place up. I'm going home. I'm going to go take a nap. Do I get to do that? I don't want to do that because I'm not driven by only my physical appetites for things. And neither are you. Amen. If you've been set free by Jesus Christ, you're no longer a slave to your sin Amen. or even your physical appetites. That's why good Christians fast. They spend time away from food. Why? It's a good exercise. And you dedicate that stuff to the Lord. And you say, Lord, I love you. And I'm going to give this thing as a sacrifice to you. And I'm not going to eat. Yes, that is an acceptable thing. Well, we're not under the law. I know that. But it's a good practice. Amen. It is a very good practice to say no to the things that you want. I don't own a boat. But I'd like to. I don't own a helicopter. But when I'm in traffic, I'd like to. I would love to go 120 miles an hour. But I don't get to. Listen unsatisfied desires happen all day long. And if you think you are deserving of having everything you want, you're living in sin, regardless of what they tell you on TV. Proverbs 16, 26 says, the appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. Did you ever think that your need actually drives you on to greater things? I know you wouldn't go to work unless they paid you. Because then what are you going to do? You're just going to take free checks from Biden all your life? You don't want to do that. There's no fulfillment in that. Don't get me started. <laughs> Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Do you know, most of the times when we laugh, it's at someone's expense. You can go, you go on the internet and there's, there's like fail army. There's like all these people, you know, falling down, hurting themselves, cracking up their cars. And it's like, ah, oh, ah, ah. I'm glad it's not my car. 
If it was a, if it was a recorded event of something I was going through, I'll bet you I wouldn't find it funny. Very often the things that we laugh at are at someone else's expense. And it's really hard to find things that are actually universally funny without denigrating someone. And laughing doesn't solve anything, and sometimes it looks a little <laughs> out of place. I'm just saying. If you get cornered with a question, don't laugh it off, because it's not funny. Although you try to get everyone to believe it. <laughs> it's not funny. So. Luke 12, 19 says, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You see, that's what he's talking about. Think that I don't have a care in the world. Do you have an idea of the reality of the depth of the sin that still lies in your life? What are you laughing at? And until you do business with that, you don't have a right to just... Most, most people find frivolity and laughter a way to get away from reality, a way to forget about things for a while. And that's not what Jesus wants us to do. He goes, if you're laughing now and, you know, everything's good and you got everything you need, you're not hungry, you know, everybody likes you. And it, oh, okay, well, that's great. Well, there's going to be a day when you stand before the Lord God of heaven and you'll have to give an account for your entire life and what did you do with your time? It's a very sobering passage. That's why I struggled with it. James 4, 7 to 10 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he he will lift you up. Amen. People are usually so busy about hiding their imperfections and about pretending to be something they're not, they don't ever mourn over their sin. Mm -hmm. Blessed are you if you mourn, because you're mourning, hopefully, over the depravity of your own soul yeah. and the difficulty it is for you to gain a control of it. Everybody likes to think they're in control of their life. You know, there are certain things that you like and certain things that you don't like. You got control over that? What's your favorite color? You got control over that? Let me see you change it. Your genetic makeup. You think you can change that? Can you make a hair black or white? Well, a little peroxide might help, but what are you going to do? There are a lot of things about you that you can't change. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers of the false prophets. We live in a world where we're all trying to be nice. Listen, we want to be nice. We want to accept everybody. I mean, Charles Manson should live in your home, you know, and there's nobody who's bad. There's no good. There's no bad. It's just an opinion. We live in a world where they're trying in the name of compromise for us all to get along. a bunch of garbage. Yep. Oh, I'm so fired up. I'm sorry. <laughs> James 4.4 4 says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Making yourself a friend of this world's system makes you an enemy of God. That's some pretty serious battle lines that get drawn. So Pastor Dave wants to be well-liked by people in the town. And I, I don't want you to hate me. I want you to love me. And you know why people do that? Because they're so insecure. Yep. Because they don't understand the love of God and they, or they haven't received it fully. God loved you enough that he came down personally and died for you as a gift. You, well, how could you serve a God that sends people to hell? People send themselves to hell because there are two doors and anyone within the hearing of my voice, you know there's a choice. You can choose life with Jesus Christ or death by doing everything you want to do. Well, what about that 
person on a desert island that's never heard about Jesus. Well, you're going to get yourself a ticket and go there? No, I'm just saying. Yeah, I know. That's the whole thing. You're just saying. You don't really care. You're just trying to avoid the issue. I have these conversations in my head, but I don't normally speak this way to people. We have a world that is full of self-help, that's full of self-love, that's so concerned with your self-image. You know, every kindergartner gets a prize, and there's no one who's first. Really? Is that how life works? No, that's how Marxism works, but that's not how life works. Self. It's all self-driven. Everyone wins. Nobody loses. Well, tell that to the Olympians, who, because of their activities, have made everyone not want to watch them. <laughs> Advertisers are crazy now because nobody's watching their ads, so they feel like they got ripped off anyway. Political correctness. What the heck is that? That means we sacrifice truth for people's feelings. I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want to call you fat because you'll get mad at me. I don't want to say you got like, like a doctor can't come in and say, you're morbidly obese, you need to lose 150 pounds. Really? Why do doctors get away with it? But once you leave that office, God forbid you speak truth to somebody that hurts their feelings. Yeah. You tell somebody they need a Tic Tac, they're going to sue you. <laughs> because truth is denigrated. It's not important anymore. What's important is how you feel. I don't even like to say the word anymore. Feel. How you feeling? Have, you feel good? You... Is there nothing more important than how you feel? How are you? Now, there's a substance question, okay? There's a truth question. I'm sorry. I... Forgive me. I haven't had a lot of sleep, but I get this way. <laughs> Political correctness, subjective truth. Well, that's your truth. My truth is, you know, I come from a long line of people that just kill everyone that, that they don't like. So that's my truth. Because you won't accept the biblical model. And so you're just going to make it up as you go along. But that doesn't work because what happens when my truth and your truth collide? It's the one who's stronger who wins. Right. It doesn't work. Feelings over truth. And people are so fear-based. Fear-based. Everything is fear-based. And people are people-pleasers. You know what people-pleasers are? Yep. I, ho I hope you like me. I didn't hurt your feelings. Did I, did I say anything during the sermon that hurt you? I'm really, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm, can you forgive me, please? I'll, I'll never, ever speak in the name of Jesus again. That's what the world wants. That's what the world is trying to drive us to. But if you're going to be a friend of the world, you're going to be an enemy of God. So you're going to make your choice. Either you're going to speak truth and you're going to speak life and you're going to tell people about Jesus because they need him and they're going to die and spend eternity in hell. Right. Or you're going to be conformed to the image of this world and pressed into its mold. And there is no more pressure than there is today. I'm convinced. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. If you're a Christian, it means that you are the possession of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. We do what he says. Because he owns us. He bought us. He paid for us with his blood. Don't become servants of men. Don't become a slave of others. Don't become a people pleaser. Don't be so worried about people getting their emotions all twisted up. Obviously, speak the truth in love. Always. Speak the truth in love. But don't forget the truth. And real love doesn't just nod when you know the truth is otherwise. Last slide. And the crowd went wild. <laughs> Blessed are you if you have poverty, poverty of spirit. You will have riches, riches in Christ Jesus. Blessed are you who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because you'll be filled. Beware of satisfaction. It breeds apathy. 
Blessed are you if you weep, if you mourn over your sinful condition, over the difficulty in other people's lives and the grip that sin has on them. Do you have a loved one who doesn't know Jesus Christ? Yes. You should weep for them. It should break your heart. You should be in your prayer closet faithfully praying for these people. And I don't know about you, but I'm not that faithful. I'd rather slap them in the submission. <laughs> but that never works. Be careful if you're seeking for people to like you to the place where you're compromising on truth. And it's happening all around us, guys. Blessed are you when people despise you and manipulate you and they revile you and your name is counted as evil. Leap for joy, Jesus says. Boy, we need this message. We need this teaching. As the worship team comes up, I'm going to pray with you guys and I want you to pray to the Lord. Father, we need to have a heavenly view. We need to be renewed in our minds. We need to be softened in our hearts, Lord, so that we can do and be the people that you call us to be. In the quiet of this moment, Lord, you know each one of our hearts. You know where we lack. I pray that your spirit stir us up to be hungry for you. That we would be willing to be poor we have nothing to offer, Lord. So we rely upon you to fill us and give us something to give away to others. Help us, Lord, not to be sucked down the drain with the rest of the world. Help us to be changed and renewed in our mind by your word. And Lord, I pray that you would inspire us, that it would move to our feet so we might do those things that please you. In Jesus' name, amen.